Behold how good it is and how pleasant when brethren dwell in unity. This week's Torah portion covers Deuteronomy 16, 18 to 21, 9. In these chapters, Moses shares God's social contract with the Israelites. Justice, justice, you shall pursue is the portion's mantra. The portion lays out the shared responsibilities of Israel's leaders, judges, priests, prophets, and kings. Judges are to be appointed in each town that the Israelites settle. Judges aim to apply the Torah's guidelines. They have to be ethically upright and show no bias. When the courts of law are unable to interpret the Torah and make a decision, they are to consult the priest. The priest act almost as the Supreme Court and issue a final ruling. Until this moment, Moses has served the people as their supreme leader and prophet, but he will not be there to shepherd them through the formation of the new state. He promises the people that after he is gone, God will deliver the nation another prophet, starting with Joshua. Moses cautions the people against the temptation to participate in divination or sorcery like their neighbors. He also advises them how to be on guard against false prophets, cautions that apply to our day as well. At this point in the Jewish story, the people are familiar with the office of judges, priests, and prophets. In their 40 years in the desert, all three institutions have been a critical guide to the civil order of the camp. What is very unusual in this portion of Deuteronomy is the introduction of kingship. The Deuteronomist correctly predicts that when the people take possession of the land, they will eventually hanker for a king. While it is certainly true that Israel will eventually re be ruled by a monarchy, it will take 400 years to happen. From Joshua to Samuel, Israel is under the period of judges. The Bible says that in those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as he saw fit. God does not endorse kingship. The Bible is lukewarm to the idea at best. When the people ask Samuel to appoint over them a king so they can be like all the other nations, Samuel balks. But God tells them, it is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. God allows them to cho choose a king even though they should be relying on his divine authority alone. Instituting a monarchy is one of the few instances that God does not explicitly forbid the people from copying the practices of their neighbors. The compromise is suggestive of an early democratic ideal where the people of Israel get to choose their own form of government. With what seems like a lack of imagination or foresight, they choose kingship over a federation of judges. Faced with burgeoning empires around them, the people tell Samuel that they want someone to fight their battles for them. They want an army. But as long as the Torah portion is outlining the political makeup of a settled Israel, the Deuteronomist goes ahead and lists out the guidelines for Israel's kingship. And what the Torah makes clear is that Israel's monarchy will not look the same as what the dynasties the people saw in Egypt or what they will one day witness in Babylon. Deuteronomy forbids the Israelite king from accruing a large number of wives or great numbers of horses or large stashes of gold and silver. Deuteronomy demands humility in the king, insisting that he is not to consider himself better than his brothers. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs says that the idea that a king should be humble is one of the genuine revolutions Judaism brought about in the history of spirituality. The colossal statues of pharaohs in Egypt and kings in Mesopotamia do not hint at humility. Not even the Greek thinkers considered humility as a virtue. The king of Israel, as a servant to the people and to God, he cannot claim divinity like the pharaohs, and he should not lust for empire like the Babylonians. His power is not infinite. The king is also commanded to keep the biblical writings with him and read it all the days of his life. The Torah will be the governing constitution of the land, holding a higher position of authority than the king himself. We know that Israel's future kings will struggle with these principles and often give in to the temptation of power. But what the Bible designs, according to Israeli philosopher Yoram Hazoni, is an alternative to the oppressive empires of the neighbors and path out of the chaos during the period of judges. The Bible promotes a limited state. 
Hazoni suggests that a limit on horses is a limit on vast empirical armies. A ban on extravagant wealth is a call for restraint and taxation. And a rule against too many wives is a caution against entanglement in too many foreign alliances. Hazoni concludes that Israel was the first state in the world to have been limited in its might by decree of its own God. And that concludes the Bible's Political Science 101 course. Shabbat Shalom. Behold how good it is and how pleasant when brethren dwell 